This is a video on corporate governance. Corporate governance is the set of mechanisms used to manage the relationship among stakeholders, determine the strategic direction, and control the performance of organizations. Now the shift to stakeholders from stockholders is a more recent one where we have moved away, uh, especially here in the US, from the shareholder is king and it's all about profit to a larger view of stakeholders and includes uh, customers, employees, uh, and society at large. Modern corporations are characterized by what is called an agency relationship that is created when one party, uh, in this case the firm's owner, hires and pays another party, in this case top-level managers, to use its decision-making skills on its behalf, to be its agent. Uh, so this separates uh, the ownership of the firm from those actually running the firm. This creates the need for corporate governance because this separation of ownership can cause agency problems. As Adam Smith said, Managers of other people's money rarely watch over it with the same anxious vigilance with which they would watch over their own, and they very easily give themselves a dispensation, i.e. cut of said money. Uh, negligence and profusion must always prevail. So here is a survey of what people at large consider uh, the honesty and ethical standards of people in different firms nurses and military officers doing very well, uh, business executives actually coming in behind the lawyers, which is a little painful, uh, but we're still ahead of members of Congress. So as I said, the separation of ownership and control of the firm creates an agency problem when the agent pursues goals that conflict with the principal's goals, i.e. they put uh, some personal managerial goal ahead of what the owners would pursue that they pursue. Uh, so principles establish and use governance mechanisms to try to control this problem. So one definition as we move into discussing risk of the firm and the manager is the managerial employment risk. Uh, this is the risk that the manager uh, could lose their job or lose a big bonus uh, or even a loss of reputation due to firm performance. As we have talked about previously, uh, there are different levels of diversification and the optimum diversification uh, tends to be in this related constrained area. Um, now that is the optimum for profitability of the firm, which is of course what the shareholders want. Managers, however, are less concerned about maximum profit and more concerned about minimizing losses, minimizing bad quarters, bad reports. Um, so shifting out into farther and farther amounts of diversification will give them that. The overall performance will drop, but the uh, chances that any one quarter will be really bad due to something beyond their control that is you know, more industry related uh, goes down. So much like diversifying your stock portfolio, uh, it's the same idea. However, while shareholders can easily pick up new shares in other industries to get a diverse portfolio, managers cannot easily pick up new jobs across multiple uh, industries. So by diversifying the firm at their one job, they can create a similar uh, reduction in risk uh, for themselves. Internal and external government mechanisms. There are three internal and one external. Uh, you have the ownership concentration, uh, the board of directors, uh, executive compensation, and then the sole external is the market for corporate control. This is where a poorly run firm uh, is easier to take over uh, in a hostile bid of buying out enough stock to basically take over control of the firm, kick out uh, the current management, and put in new, better management thereby increasing the profit and ultimately the share price of whoever took over uh, the firm. Ownership concentration is based on the number of large block shareholders, uh, typically 
talked about of people who have at least 1% share in the company uh, and the percentage of shares that they own. Uh, institutional investors, uh, which are pension funds, mutual funds, uh, who are pooling together large amounts of uh, individual stockholders into one large purchasing uh, area, are increasingly powerful force in America. They now are much more active uh, with their positions of concentrated ownership to sort of force managers uh, to make decisions that help maximize the firm's value and therefore the return on the stock. This is a chart that's a little outdated, um, but shows sort of the general trend towards more and more percent of the overall stock market being owned by institutional investors. Uh, today, the number is over 90%. So 90% of the shares in the US stock market are owned by institutional investors. So a board of directors. In the US and the UK, a firm's board of directors uh, composed of insiders, uh, outsiders, and related outsiders. An insider being an employee of the firm, an outsider uh, being someone, in theory, totally unrelated to the firm, and uh, related outsiders uh, could be someone who is like a former uh, employee of the firm or somewhere else it's more of a gray area. Uh, this government mechanism is expected to represent shareholders' collective interests. Uh, the percentage of outside directors on many boards now exceeds uh, inside directors, largely due to the SOX Act that requires outsiders to be um, more independent um, and to have certain levels uh, on the board. Uh, board compensation. So. Uh, in 2012, we were up to 232K on average for an S&P 500 director. That number now is probably closer to 300K, um, but they are getting fairly well compensated for a few meetings a year. So the roles of the board, uh, one is to monitor uh, the executive, try to make sure that they are doing what they're saying they're doing, figure out executive compensation, uh, how should they best financially incentivize the CEO and the C-suite to uh, have shareholder interests at heart, uh, figure out uh, succession planning, who is going to be the next CEO, especially if there is some type of scandal and the current CEO leaves quickly, uh, be in charge of auditing. They can also offer advice to the CEO, as many of them are often CEOs of other firms or former CEOs of other firms. Um, although some scholars argue that this is a problem because if the board gives advice to the CEO and the CEO does it and it fails, the board is then in a difficult position to punish the CEO for poor performance since the CEO is only following the board's advice. Uh, and then finally, advocacy. Uh, board members can also have positions on large financial institutions, uh, for instance, and help them get better uh, terms uh, because of that on their financing, etc. So this then moves on to strategy formulation and implementation. They can sort of uh, help the CEO craft the overall strategy, uh, but then the CEO and managers are going to do the actual implementation. That feeds into firm performance, which then goes back to uh, the roles and actions of the board. So board focus has increased considerably since uh, new laws are passed to make them potentially liable uh, for issues with the firm. Uh, where beforehand they had faced no liability um, and they were often you know, friends with the CEO, uh, it was much more commonly viewed to sort of be a rubber stamping of what the CEO wanted. Um, now that they can potentially be sued uh, if something goes awry at the firm, they're much more interested in uh, how to take an active role in that. And so you see them uh, you know, doubling the amount that they are interested in the strategy of the firm, um, picking the CEOs well, and much more uh, trying to uh, help with risk management, up to 60% from 11%. Um, so this is a, a huge shift uh, because of that new liability for them. 
So executive compensation includes salary, bonuses, long-term incentives, uh, stocks, options, etc. Um, it's highly visible and often criticized, um, but the board of directors determines the effectiveness of the executive compensation system. Now, the idea between paying a CEO highly uh, in stock is to therefore align themselves with stockholders because then they are a stockholder themselves. If the stock goes up, the CEO gets wealthier and so they should be incentivized to make the stock price do very well. Now, the problem, uh, there's a different picture. The problem with that is that uh, the amount of compensation has gotten quite high. I see this in early 2000s, making 700 times the pay of the average worker. Um, and part of the reason for this is that we found that CEOs, to be properly incentivized, uh, their compensation package needs to be a uh, certain percentage relative to their own wealth. The problem with that is as you continue to pay CEOs lots and lots of money to keep them incentivized, they get wealthier and wealthier, so then you have to pay them even more to keep them further incentivized, and thus you have this growing uh, divide because of this. You can also help deal with other uh, alignment issues from conflicts can arise between the principals, i.e. shareholders, and their managerial agents. Um, for instance, if a company receives a buyout offer, the shareholders uh, are going to be excited about this because they could get a good return on their investment, make money, you tend to get a premium on the current stock price when there's a buyout. However, uh, managers may resist this for fear of losing their jobs. So boards can include the golden parachute as a way to make managers uh, happy with the buyout because they no longer have to fear uh, their employment risk because they too will get a fat paycheck if uh, the sale goes through. From Adam Smith, uh, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher or the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interests, we address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. Uh, never talk to them of our necessities, but of their advantages. So this is just sort of the basis for uh, why we would use financial incentives uh, for CEOs to align their interests uh, with the shareholders. Corporate control, while shareholders and boards of directors may have become more vigilant in their control of managerial decision, uh, they're often insufficient to govern managerial behavior in many large companies. The bigger the company, the more complexity, the harder it is for a board to fully understand all of the nuances. Uh, this is another reason that CEOs uh, like diversification because it makes it harder to monitor all of uh, the various areas that they're in, uh, giving them sort of a informational advantage over the board that's supposed to be watching them. Um, so because of this, uh, the mark for corporate control is an important governance mechanism, has helped keep firms in check that are becoming overly inefficient, um, not taking risks as their stock price uh, gets depressed due to poor performance, it gets easier to get taken over, um, and then uh, the new owners uh, clean house and put new people in top positions, so then the uh, fear of this happening can help keep managers from pushing too far into inefficiencies and their own self-interest. Uh, so there's a quote about that, the lower the stock price relative to what it could have been with more efficient management, the more attractive the takeover becomes to those who believe that they can manage the company more efficiently and the potential to return from the successful takeover and revitalization of a poorly run company can be enormous. So if you take a company that's been run into the ground, turn it around, uh, you then would have gotten a huge uh, premium on what you paid for the company. All right, so this is done primarily through uh, purchasing large amounts of shares. You don't actually have to buy 100% of the company. You just have to buy enough to get some board seats and influence with the board so that you can then fire current management, put new people in, or uh, put enough fear in the current management that they then uh, do what you want them to do. 
this is becoming more common these days uh, and sometimes unsuccessfully uh, but uh, we saw some of this with Carl Ican uh, trying to force Apple to do some of the stuff that he wanted it to do with sort of a sliver of so there is a large difference between corporate governance globally. Uh, historically, the U.S. is focused on maximizing shareholder value, um, though that is now shifting to a much more stakeholder approach that is common in other places. Uh, employees in Germany took a prominent role, um, as there is one third of the board has to be employees for uh, companies between 500 and 2,000 employees, and almost half, not quite half, has to be on the board employees for companies with 2,000 plus employees. Now because of this you might not be surprised to learn that in Germany there are many companies that have just under 2,000 employees. Um, they get close to that threshold and they don't cross it through outsourcing and some other means. Generally this has been good while there's hesitance to give you know even more board seats to employees. Uh, most employees feel like they are better represented by having some people uh, on the board to talk to the top management team. Japanese shareholders have historically played almost no role until recently, um, but now there's some new activist shareholders uh, that are becoming more common over there. And as the world uh, globalizes, uh, you see a shift towards sort of standardizing some of these systems and laws uh, just make it easier uh, because if you're a huge multinational firm it's easier to just pick rules that make all of the countries happy instead of trying to be different in different countries. So here's some examples. Uh, the recommendation of director independence in Brazil they want as many as possible. Russia at least a quarter, Singapore a third, majority in the UK, substantial majority here. Uh, should the executive be both the CEO and the chairperson? You have split recommended, split required, recommended, and separation is one of three acceptable alternatives here. Auto rotation required. Uh, many countries don't address this. It's recommended in the US. It is required um, in the UK. Um, and then fascinatingly, is disclosure required if the company is not complying with these recommendations? Uh, in many cases, no. So some of these are much weaker than others. Uh, so there's a lot of difference between uh, governance across the world. If you have effective governance mechanisms, uh, this can help ensure the interests of all stakeholders are served, not just uh, short-term stock price wins, but long-term success for the employees to keep their job, we're not like polluting the environment, so it's good for society. Long-term success uh, when they're governed uh, help permit the satisfaction of the capital markets, stakeholders, shareholders, uh, creditors, product market, uh, people like customers and suppliers, both managerial and non-managerial employees. Effective governance produces ethical behavior in forming and implementing these strategies. We're a little less focused on maximizing profits.